lest we forget the triumph over slavery. This year, Ghana commemorates many unique and important milestones. The 250th anniversary of the 1763 Burby Slave Rebellion, the 190th anniversary of the 1823 Slave Rebellion, the 175th anniversary of the abolition of slavery and the emancipation of enslaved Africans, the 170th the arrivals of arrival of Indians in Guyana, the 100th of the arrival of Chinese in Guyana. And as the board of the Guyanese Cultural Association of New York highlighted in their online magazine earlier this year, 250 plus 190 plus 175 plus 160 equals sacrifices and hopes after the sacrifices, accomplishing the hopes. It is within this context, and after a magnificent 250th anniversary lecture series, in which we had Sir Hilary Beckles, Dr. Alvin Thompson, and Dr. Vereen Shepherd, who we consider Caribbean royalty when it comes to history, that we have today's launch. In 2011, our distinguished speakers will provide a comprehensive overview of the UNESCO Mobile Slavery Exhibition, and hence my task is to introduce them as we launch this event with a first viewing of this marvelous exhibition, which will use pictures and concepts to help us to commemorate and better understand the epic journey of slavery. Of course, we've had some drumming, we'll have some dancing, and we'll have poetry. As chair of this event, it's my privilege to be your guide, and I hope this exhibition will inspire us all to see the triumph of the human spirit and to be better human beings. I end my welcome to you by quoting from the Commission on Africa's definition of culture, which states, when we speak of the culture of a place, we're talking about far more than its artistic or cultural products, literature, music, dance, art, sculpture, theater, film, and sport. All of these, of course, are important expressions of culture of any social group and are part of its shared joy in the business of being alive. Culture is about shared patterns of identity, symbolic meaning, aspiration, and about the relationships between individuals and groups within that society. Culture is also about the relationships, about ideas and perspectives, about self-respect and the sense of security, about how individuals are socialized and the values are formed and transmitted. Culture is also deeply intertwined with structures of power and wealth. Culture, therefore, is about common bonding, common vision, shared values, and shared goals. I hope this exhibition, lest we forget, the triumph over slavery is catalytic in how we come to accept each other as Guyanese, Caribbean, and global human beings. Welcome once again. I now have the pleasure of asking Ms. Olga Cunha Addo to come to the podium to read an excerpt of the slavery of the speech given by Frederick Douglass on the 4th of July 1852. Let's welcome her to the podium. Your Excellency, the Honorable Minister, the Russian Premier, Mr. Chair. Frederick Douglass was uh, the best known and most influential African American leader of the 1800s. Born a slave in Maryland, he managed to escape to the north of the United States in 1838. In 1852, the leading citizens of Rochester, New York, asked Douglas to give a speech as part of their 4th of July celebrations. Douglas accepted the invitation, and this is therefore an excerpt. Fellow citizens, pardon me and allow me to ask, why am I called upon to speak here today? What has to present to do with your independence? 
Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in the Declaration of Independence extended to us? I say with a sad sense of disparity between us, I am not included within the pale of this glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. This 4th of July is yours. My subject and fellow citizens is American slavery. I shall see this day and its popular characteristics from the slave's point of view. Standing with God and a crushed and bleeding slave on this occasion, I will, in the name of humanity, which is outraged, in the name of the Constitution and the Bible, which are disregarded and trampled upon, dare to call into question and to denounce, with all the emphasis I can command, everything that serves to perpetuate slavery. But I fancy I hear some of you, my audience, say, would you argue more and denounce less? Or would you persuade more and rebuke less? Your cause would be more than likely to succeed. But I submit, where all is plain, there is nothing to be argued. What point of the anti-slavery creed would you have me argue? Must I undertake to prove that a slave is a man? That he's the rightful owner of his body? What? Am I to argue that it is wrong to make men brutes, to rob them of their liberty, to work them without wages, to beat them with sticks, to flay their flesh, to lash them, to load their limbs with irons, to hunt them like dogs, to sell them in auctions, to sunder their families, to knock out their teeth, to burn their flesh, to starve them into obedient submission to their masters. Does, no, I will not. I have better employment for my time and strength than any such arguments would imply. What then remains to be argued? The time for such argument is past. At a time like this, scorching irony, not persuasive argument, is needed. For what is needed is not light. Not a shower. We need the storm, we need a whirlwind, and we need the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quickened, the conscience of the nation must be roused, and the hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed, and its crimes against God and man must be denounced. What to the American slave is your fourth of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days of the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham. Your boasted liberty and unholy license, your prayers and your hymns and your songs and your sermons of thanksgiving with all their religious parade and solemnity are to him a bombast, a fraud and deception. A thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. Frederick Douglass delivered on the 4th of July, 1852, lest we forget. So um, it's with a feeling of great joy and relief, anxiety, everything. I am here to give you a background of this exhibition. Excerpts of which Dr. Rose hopes that all of you will keep as, as a, key, a souvenir for today's uh, launching. So uh, 
perhaps you will follow me a little bit from there. Lest we forget the triumph over slavery, the triumph over slavery, an enlightening exhibition that offers an inspiring look at the cultural, political, economic, and social practices enslaved Africans developed while enduring the dehumanizing conditions of slavery has been displayed in different regions of the world since its creation in 2004 at the, at the occasion of the International Year to commemorate the struggle against slavery and its abolition. Lest We Forget is an exhibition created by the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, the New York Public Library, in connection with the UNESCO Slave Root Project to mark the United Nations General Assembly's resolution proclaiming 2004 the International Year to commemorate the struggle against slavery and its abolition. Lest we forget, project is funded by UNESCO, that is, the United Nations Education, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. And it's a good time to remember that the C in UNESCO is for culture. The exhibition is unique in that it focuses less on enslaved Africans as victims and more on the ways in which they reshape their destinies and place in history through the creation of distinct cultures. In addition, lest we forget, explicitly demonstrates the huge economic impact of the slave trade and enslaved African labor on the development of the Americas and Europe and the concomitant disruption of Africa's economic, political, and social life. Some of the lasting cultural contributions explored language, religion, music, and institutions. The exhibition features 32 full-color riveting panels that reflect the experience of the transatlantic slave trade and slavery through topics including the Long March, the slave trade, labor and systems, the struggle against slavery and its abolition, and the triumph over slavery. Highlights of the stirring collection include images of the log of the slave ship Laurence, that is 1730 to 1731, the hourly record of the transatlantic voyage of the slave ship from Angola to Argentina, documenting the deaths of 64 enslaved men and women and one child. A slave auction broadside, 1849, announcing this, the sale of six Negro slaves, along with ox teams and fox hounds. A slave branding iron, 1790, used to brand enslaved Africans at the point of purchase. A slave shackles, 17, 1780, a photograph of enslaved Africans returning from the cotton field in South Carolina, circa 1870. A $2 bill featuring the, the signature of U.S. Registrar Blanche Bruce, a former slave who reclaimed ownership of himself by escaping during the Civil War. And a slave whip with a wooden grip, circa 1840, advertised and sold for the use of punishing slaves. And Le Code Noir, who recalled the Reglement Rondeau, 1742, a collection of French laws enacted to govern blacks in French colonies in the Americas, and one of the co most comprehensive slave codes ever punished. The exhibition is composed of 32 panels. Uh, we received them in three crates. They weighed over two, 600 pounds and required over 200 square meters of space, displaying space. It was curated by Howard Dodson, director of the Schomburg Center and a former member of the International Committee, the International Scientific Committee for the UNESCO Slave Root Project. Uh, I wish you the joy and the discovery that I did when we unpacked those crates last week and with a sense of revelation of how our destiny became shaped. Thank you very much. By our own national treasure, Ms. Vivian Daniels. European 
colonies in the Americas. The Spanish King Charles I started to regulate the trade in slaves by granting special permission for the importation of, sl of slaves. And in 1518, he issued the first permission allowing for organized importation of four into Hispaniola, Jamaica, and Puerto Rico. With this act, he formalized the transatlantic slave trade, which now has the dubious distinction as the largest forced migration in human history. The exact number of, of people who suffered the Middle Passage will never be known. Nevertheless, historians have estimated that approximately 11 to 13 million Africans arrived on colonial shores. The transatlantic slave trade had another dubious distinction, that of being history's greatest maritime tragedy. It is estimated that about 20 million Africans would have started the journey from various African ports, but many of them never made it to the colonial shores. In the 16th century, the mortality rates on the ships were as high as 40%. In the 17th century, it was reduced to about 15%, and eventually lowered to 10 to, 5, to, to, 10 to 5% in later years. It is estimated that during the voyages, seven to nine million Africans died on the sea. This horrendous system of slavery denuded the captive Africans of their kin, their homeland, sometimes their ancestral ethnic identity. This sense of loss would have deeply wounded the psyche of the African people who came to these shores. Yet their travails were not just psychological, but a brutal, but the brutal physical repression that they endure. The degrading treatment that was meted out to the slaves were not just demeaning, but in some cases it was criminal. In the book Hearing Slaves Speak by Trevor Bernard, and I want, because this is a book that we have uh, published as part of the Guyana Classic series. And I would like to recommend it to you. But I just want to make a brief quote from one of the cases. There are 99 cases that is in this book. And this is just the tip of what happened, because we have the records uh, of what transpired, some of the trials that took place. And in this particular book, case 66, on page 107, illustrate this point about criminality in a very graphic way. On the 10th of June, 1819, the Negress Rosie of Plantation Esperance complained to the fiscal about the treatment that was meted out to her. She was five months pregnant and was ordered to pick coffee beans. Unable to do this task, it was ordered that she be flogged. And she was flogged on Friday and she miscarried on Sunday. And here was her words that she, she, when she gave her testimony to the fiscal, the fiscal was like the magistrate of the time. She said, I was five months gone with, with child. The labor was heavy. The midwife had to force the child from me. The child was dead. One eye was out. The arm was broken, a striped visible over the head, which must have been done by the double whip. Because of the beatings, this is what happened to her child. And that's the kind of cruelty that happened during slavery. These cruelties have littered the period of slavery. Change was slow to come. And eventually on the 25th of March, 1807, the transatlantic slave trade was abolished. To mark the 200th anniversary of the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade, UNESCO and other museums around the world, like the International Slavery Museum in Liverpool, worked to put on many exhibitions and to develop the literature around slavery. 
And part of this, this particular exhibition, as Inji said, was developed in this year, and we'll have the opportunity of viewing it. In that year also, we debated a motion in our parliament, and one of the things that came out in that debate was a call for reparation from the slaver nations. We also made a commitment to ensure that the Guyanese people understand the history and the struggles of our ancestors. And with this in mind, we committed to building the 1823 monument. And very soon, we'll have that monument to honor the hundreds of enslaved people who were murdered in the Demerara Uprising of 1823. This year would be 190 years since the Demerara Uprising. And just last month, on the 23rd of February, we marked the anniversary since the 1763 Barbies slave uprising. As a people, it is important that we know our history so that we can appreciate the struggles and sacrifices of our ancestors. And hopefully, we can draw inspiration from them to ensure that we work for a better Guyana. This exhibition is a timely reminder of the MAFA, that great disaster that took place during slavery and its aptly titled, Least We Forget. We are pleased to collaborate with UNESCO uh, to bring this exhibition to you. I would like to thank all the hardworking staff, especially Mr. Elford Liverpool, the administrator of the National Museum, and Ms. Janelle Osborne, the technical director from the Borough School of Art, who have worked very hard with the other staff in putting this exhibition together. And we'd really like to thank them for their dedicated work. Let's give them a round of applause. And I would also like to encourage everyone in Guyana to come and view this exhibition. Teachers, please ensure that the school children attend Parents, please bring along your children to see what we have on display. Let's make this not just an excursion to the museum, but an excursion into history and a reminder of the MAFA and what took place with our ancestors. What MAFA got? What we want is good living, planting, boiling in me pot, fair play and good learning. Let me talk me mind like massa. Let me worship how me like. When me dead, a meager answer God. Is he for judge who right? Me no watch what side got. He can smoke a big cigar. Me go ride me bicycle in one safe spot. Let he kill me himself with a big fancy motor car. Love me and my comrades for me together. Once we na plan to kill. Who choose for commit slander must remember jail there still. Me no want one big bungalow, but me want a decent shelter with me little fridge and me, me little aisle stove and a pickup with a loud, loud speaker. Me not oblige for play golf and hockey, neither snooker nor skittle. Just give me bingo and lottery, and let me raise me twa, twa for whistle. The high man and me must have the same law, and we pickney must get the same right. He on mustn't sleep on fed a pillow, and rain, oh rain. Raina beat me born per night. Me son mustn't have to pass exam and he yon get walk through the back door. Cause he bar with a silver spoon in his mouth. And we pick me. Oh, we pick me them barn poor, poor, poor. Ha ha ha. Me obliged for get enough, enough money. What plenty rich man a feed them hearts with. Me no care for gin and whiskey. Give me me rum. <sighs> for quench me thirst. 
Let them fly high like kites. Me want a decent wage for me and my wife. And more than all, let me get my rights by John Campbell. Thank you. I am indeed honored to be here. I must thank the Minister for organizing the loan of this exhibition from UNESCO, 50th anniversary of the Barbie Slave Uprising. But I have been saying in a few places that I don't think that the Americas, the whole of Americas from the north to the south of America appreciate the significance of the 1763 Barbies uprising. It was, a, it was not as some historians call it a revolt, but as Professor Shepard said in our lecture here, it was indeed a war. But it was for the first time, you must recall, that 1763 preceded 1789 Haitian Revolution. And by the way, we are honored to have the President of Haiti visiting Guyana at this time as well. But 1763 was the first time that slaves in a year, actually for six years. And the significance of this, I believe, is not truly appreciated. And I tend to always want to associate it or to compare it with the Spartacus Revolution in Europe. Spartacus did not overthrow slavery in Europe, but it was the beginning of the end of slavery in Europe. And 1763 eventually was crushed and the colonial powers once again took office. But it was, in my humble view, the beginning of end of slavery in all the Americas and the Caribbean. It was the signal that the time has come to put an end to that type of system. Plantation slavery was one of the most horrendous forms of tyrannical rule and exploitation in modern history. It was the embodiment of the worst excesses of a depraved age. Not only did one class of humans exploit and abuse another class for a period in excess of 200 years, but throughout its existence, the slave system brutally suppressed and, at all, and all expression of disaffection on the part of outraged victims. And we heard the beautiful speech that was given by Frederick Douglass on July the 4th, 1852. Enslavement was systematized cruelty. The enslaved were virtually machines to be driven to inhuman extremes for the production of profit and machines of an intelligent, an intelligent nature which had to be terrorized, chained, beaten, tortured, maimed, and murdered in order that the master might secure huge profits and retain physical dominance over the abused chattel. And in our country, in Guyana and possibly Suriname, Slavery was particularly cruel, particularly cruel because of the very environment that they had to operate in. Where we are standing now used to be swamps, and this place where we are standing at this moment has been made habitable because of slave labor. And obviously the movement of millions of tons of clay, so clay, people obviously would have rebelled and the suppression of slavery in our part of the world here was particularly brutal. 
And because the enslaved Africans was all too human, he rebelled. And he rebelled very, very often. And his rebellion was crushed, and but he came up again and rebelled. The 1763 Barbies Rebellion was one of those very clear instances in which the enslaved African demonstrated his undisguised rejection of enslavement. The Barbies Rebellion was only exceeded in length of time by the successful 1789 Haitian Revolution and in so far as numbers are concerned by the not so successful Danish St. John's Revolt of 1733. It is therefore fitting that every Guyanese make a special effort to be part of these commemorative activities. In 1763, our forefathers wrote an indelible chapter in the textbook of human freedom when for some 16 months they resisted the might of Europe in pursuit of freedom. There are a number of, I, I, am, I am told that there are a number of interesting things about the exhibition which are very graphic in communicating both the pain of enslavement and the triumph of freedom. I would like to comment on two of these. The first is that it was put together to mark the United Nations General Assembly resolution proclaiming 2004 the International Year of, to commemorate the struggle against slavery and its abolition. The same struggle against enslavement that is epitomized by and in the 1763 Barbies War. Secondly, it is, it is both themed and titled, Least We Forget, firstly reminding ourselves of that which we should never forget and then resolving not to forget ever again this evil chapter of human history. I want also to say that we must not forget it for another reason, that the very foundations that we are building, the very societies that we are building today, and whatever achievements we have, we can trace all of our struggles for freedom and all the work and our achievement in promoting human beings and human rights, we can trace them all back to the struggle and the fight against slavery. Quite recently, Professor Shepard wondered why history is not compulsory, a compulsory subject in our schools, and I share that concern with her. For if we are to remember, then first we must know, and there is no better place of knowing than being taught in our schools. Um, the table which shares with me to set up a national reparation committee to research the case for reparations. Be because you know some of the huge wealth that accumulated in Europe. I think Professor Beckles brought these out in very much details and graphically. Have been connected to not only the slave trade, but the businesses in this part of the world that benefited from free slave labor. And in our own case, a former chairman of Booker's died. When he died, he left hundreds of millions of pounds in his estate, all of which were made right here in our country. Fellow Guyanese, this is a historic occasion and a very serious moment in time. And so it gives me great pleasure to declare this UNESCO Mobile Slavery Exhibition open. And I want to echo Minister Anthony's call that everyone should make an effort to see this exhibition. And schools, they should, it should be arranged that school children 
come and visit this exhibition that is here because I understand it's only going to be here for one month. So for one month, so I hope that we take advantage of that month to have, uh, to have maximum viewing of this exhibition. It is my hope that children and young persons in particular will be given the opportunity to see, share, and discuss the exhibition. I now declare the exhibition open to the public. Thank you for your attention. We will now have the appreciation done by Ms. Donna Henry from the National Archives. Following that, we would like to have little Latifa Agard from North Georgetown Primary School to join us so that we can go and cut the ribbon. And I also feel privileged that um, the President would ask myself, Dr. Frank Anthony, and uh, Professor McGowan to be part of a reparations committee. Um, I know that four countries have already established theirs and there's going to be a major conference in July in the UK to discuss this, so I appreciate that. Um, can I now have, will you help me bring Ms. Donald Henry to do the appreciation? <laughs> 